there's a balance between what is our brand, how do we protect our brand, how do we scale, how do we grow at a sustainable rate, right? For people who are speakers who we know are speakers, we, we kind of know the pitch. And that's something that we can scale fairly quickly. For people who reply, how do we personalize our responses to that person? How do we get as hyper-personalized as possible to that ICP? You know, how can we do that based on schools that people go to? Which makes it look like a lot more like, you know, a friend sent this to you than a company sent this to you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another episode of the Sales Spotlight Podcast, the show where you get to overcome your biggest cold email and outbound sales challenges by listening to insights from the top experts in the space. And today, we got another fun guest for you. He has a super interesting background. His work has been published in well-known publications like The New Yorker, The Diplomat, and The Huffington Post. Uh, he's fluent in Chinese and more recently, he's been absolutely killing it with email marketing that includes both outbound as well as inbound. He sent over 60 million emails. His email marketing campaigns have generated over $2 million and he's achieved an astonishing 1000% ROI with cold emails. You heard that right. 1000%. Ladies and gentlemen, Boys and girls, say hello to the one, the only, James Haynes. James, welcome to the show, mate. Hey, glad to be here, Jay. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolute pleasure, James. Thank you for joining me. And um, James, you've been up to some fun stuff. Uh, we And we're going to dive all into the uh, email marketing side of things. But before we get into that, could you give us a quick background about uh, your professional journey and what you're up to right now? Sure thing. Um, so I started out in marketing. I was doing growth marketing at a startup based in D.C. that focused on study abroad. And that was where I met my current manager. Um, that's who I work for now at the Speaker Lab. And in between uh, those two jobs, I worked at a think tank on China policy in D.C. and also uh, embarked on an adventure doing mattress recycling, starting my own company, working on uh, raising money and all that sort of thing. So have some founder experience, uh, some startup experience, and then uh, some fun China experience as well. <laughs> That's nice. That's wonderful. A, a mixed bag of fun experiences sounds like James. Uh, and James, you said you met your current manager uh, at the Speaker Lab during your previous role. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Speaker Lab and what you guys are doing? So some of the things that I'm currently doing here at TSL, so I'm, uh, again, in growth marketing, some of the main things that I've been working on have uh, been focusing on data, uh, our CRM process, as well as uh, content marketing with SEO. But one of the big things that I've been focusing on uh, has been email and both within our own sales funnel, so our existing inbound, uh, but then with our out cold outbound as well. And that's been a new funnel that we've been working on in the last, uh, I would say, 12 months experimenting with and uh, now trying to scale. That sounds awesome. So you said you've been uh, experimenting with email for a while, uh, initially inbound and more recently outbound, right? Uh, so what made you see an opportunity with email marketing, uh, given the speaker lab and the audience that you have? Yeah, I think it, a lot of it has to do with how well our email list works. So whenever you mention those numbers, uh, our, our inbound email list over the last year, uh, we, we track uh, how, how people click on our ads or click on our uh, emails uh, to generate uh, calls with our sales team. And that's generated $2 million in the last year. That's something that I've managed. And uh, it's something that has worked. Uh, and so for us to try something like cold outbound, it's like, well, this is this seems like a really high ROI, high upside channel. There's not a lot of stuff that we need to get started. And this is something where we've already found our ICP. We've already found our initial customer profile. Uh, which tends to be somebody who is either an existing speaker or a new speaker in particular niches. Mm. And that's who we really work on uh, for our, our product, which is a high ticket coaching product. Got it. So you already had a solid framework in terms of um, inbound emails. And uh, so you just kind of thought it's a natural progression would be to experiment with outbound. And from what I understand, it's working like an absolute charm, correct? Yeah, yeah. I think the... The proof has been in the pudding in terms of what we've seen in terms of ROI. It's definitely there. 
I think the main challenge that we face is the same challenge that a lot of people doing cold outbound face, which is how do we scale this sustainably? How do we protect our brand while at the same time reaching as many people as possible? And those are the kinds of problems I've been mm. focusing on. Got it. Uh, I, I want to touch upon that later, James, but let's go right to the beginning. So once you realize, okay, um, the your your inbound emails are working really well and you decided to try outbound, what were the first couple of steps um, you took to get this process started? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, for us, there were two sort of two steps. Uh, one was we worked with an agency called Syntaz just to kind of get the basic framework. So they work with instantly as a sort of CRM for cold outbound. And a lot of the materials that they had on getting started were really helpful to us with starting up. Uh, so they sort of showed us a playbook and, and handed it off. Another person who I'll mention here uh, that was really helpful for me starting out was Cole Gordon. Um, Cole has uh, a course on school, uh, S-K-O-O-L. And whenever I started, I basically went through all of his videos on this, uh, walking through the process, going through his Google Docs, and basically plugging and playing uh, with our own offer, which is, is similar enough to Cole's that it made sense. So those were sort of the two things that mm -hmm. got us started. We did an initial trial run, I'd say, uh, probably Q4 of 2022, Q1, going into Q1 of this year. But it wasn't really until uh, May of this year, 2023, that we really got it going, started plugging things in and started scaling. That's great. And in terms from, uh, let's say you mentioned a couple of the tools that you're using, uh, what are what was the initial setup like uh, in terms of the tools that you needed or what did you need to get started? Yeah, so sort of the back end was something that we already had in place. So in terms of SDR sales team, that whole funnel, working with them, the CRM of HubSpot, that was already set up. So essentially what I was managing was monitoring all that side, hmm. but then implementing the front end, which was essentially what's our lead list? Who are we looking for? What, how does that match with our RCP? So going through LinkedIn Sales Navigator, for instance, um, that was that was one uh, main main thing that I used. But then also working with Syntaz uh, and buying uh, lists of leads that were more tailored to us um, that they had already cleaned, and then loading those into instantly setting up those campaigns, setting up the sequences and so on, and then setting up landing pages through our own uh, CRM. Uh, through our own website uh, that all link together uh, with our with our lead magnets with our lead forms. Got it. So, in, in terms of uh, prospecting, was LinkedIn Sales Navigator one of the core tools that you used, or were there any others which supplemented the prospecting process as well, James? Yeah. So we experimented with different things. We experimented with uh, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, Apollo, several other tools. And essentially, the thing that did it for me with LinkedIn Sales Navigator, it's not a perfect tool, but it is really good at segmenting people by like individual companies, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll give the more specific. So for us, we're a speaking coaching mm. business. So unlike other organizations where they might be looking for a VP of marketing or a VP of sales because they're trying to sell a SaaS product. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to find individual decision makers who are typically running their own speaking business or working with other people to hmm. uh, work on their own sort of brand. And so to get as close to that individual person is really what we're trying to do. So in a sense, it's, it's easier because we don't have to guess who the decision maker is. But in another sense, it's more challenging because, OK, how do you actually get to that person? How do you actually find uh, those people who are going to be in that ICP? And LinkedIn, for you know, uh, mm. for whatever its flaws may be, and certainly you know, finding emails and that sort of thing for each person, um, it's pretty good at finding people who are demonstrating the markings that we look for in a ICP. Mm. That's interesting uh, because I I guess as opposed to as you said, SaaS businesses or many agencies, your target ICP is completely different. So it involves a kind of different playbook. And before you reached out to them, James, um, were there like, uh, what kind of characteristics or triggers were you looking to be set off by your ICP in order to ensure that the timing of your cold emails were right? Yeah, that's a good question. 
I think um, for some speakers, it would be things like, have they recently changed jobs to list their headline as full-time speaker, for instance? Um, so have they recently just started a speaking business? That's a really key type of customer for us because a lot of what we do help speakers to scale speaking businesses once they've started and really build that out as a key stream of income. So that would be one sort of example. Uh, maybe another would be somebody who does something similar in the coaching or consulting spaces, which tend to be very similar in terms of the type of person who would do that and the type of person who would speak. So those would be a couple of triggers that we would kind of look at, as well as things just like general activity. You know, if they're if they're active on LinkedIn, you know, they're probably going to be more likely to have an active email address, that sort of thing. Mm, got it. Uh, that makes sense. And so you you guys, I guess, had the benefit of a very clearly defined ICP and found a good way to identify the right kind of prospects and the triggers that would kind of optimize the timing. Getting to the actual emails themselves, what were what does your sequences and the copy of the email itself look like? Could you share a little bit more about that, James? Sure. So we started this out differently from how we've ended up doing this. What we started out doing was sort of a version of, hey, we have this speaking opportunity for you, which is copy that for our inbound leads made a lot of sense. Whenever we were talking about the revenue people can make from speaking, the average, uh, for example, the average gig uh, fee that uh, established speakers charge is $15,000. So that sort of hook was really what we started with. But we, what we found was whenever we emailed people saying, hey, we've got a speaking opportunity for you, we've you know, got this chance for income for you, they were thinking, oh, this is like an agency or this is, this is some event organizer who's reaching out to me who wants to give me basically a free gig, which is a great hook in terms of getting people to respond. And we saw really good response rates from that. But I think the sacrifice that we made with that was all the people who were saying, oh, I thought this was a free gig and you're actually making me pay for something. And that hurt our brand. So for us, you know, as we're a company mm. that's sort of established mm. and looking to scale and really looking to build that brand, it was a sacrifice of like, okay, well, I know that we can get better reply rates using this different copy and potentially even, you know, better close rates. But if we're going to be closing mm. slightly higher rates while at the same time hurting our brand with, you know, half our potential customers, that's not worth it for us. So what we switched to was something very similar to what we've hmm. seen with like, uh, again, Cole Gordon um, and Instantly and other providers like that who sort of uh, pitched this sort of framework of here's the offer, um, here's the opportunity. We use the quick question as hmm. our first email in the sequence. And then from there, basically, okay, doing the follow-up, hmm. sending the landing page video, and then if they don't respond, sending a breakup email. And once we have sent them through that sequence, wait 60 days, send a revised sequence. So that's sort of what we've shifted to from that initial uh, sort of gig opportunity. That's interesting because uh, you mentioned you basically um, sacrificed a higher reply and potentially closing rate just because it didn't make it was, wasn't in the long-term interest of the brand. Um, and that's I think that's a probably a good call, right? It's not all about, I mean, a reply rate today might look good, but if it's going to harm you one year down the line, was it really um, that effective? So I think that's a good call and that's super interesting to hear as well, James. Uh, coming to reply rate, uh, one of the things um, I'm super interested to learn about is the metrics that you achieved. Uh, so firstly, how long did it take for you to see traction from your outbound campaigns, James? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So it took from whenever we really went all in on this in May, whenever I was uh, managing this, it took about 40 days for us to get our first close. We're now, uh, we, we went on to see about one close a month. Now we're more like two closes a month and we're high ticket sales. So that's part of the ROI of this is if we're just spending you know, a couple hundred dollars on tech and leads for this, but then our, our ticket price is four figures, five mm. figures, you know, that pays for itself pretty quickly. Mm. And so for me, I remember mm. going through the early summer, basically refreshing, you know, have, have we closed, have we closed? And really just like, I know this can work. I believe this can work, but you don't see it until you get that close. 
and that was really big for us um, and that helped us mm. to be able to put more money into it so so you said it, it took you about 40 days and until you first saw was was seeing like the first couple of closes the first sign that this is an an effective strategy correct yeah yeah i would say that's right and i think something that i saw going in and what helped me sort of trust the process was that we were getting uh, a lot of consistent responses and we were making a good offer and we had a proven product so in one sense, I mm. figured this is going to be kind of a matter of time, but whenever you're consistently setting people and mm. trying to book meetings and you're just waiting for that close, that's that's sort of the the valley where you're 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 waiting for it to pay off and uh, you 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 haven't seen it yet. Uh, but I'm glad we got to the other side of that. Absolutely. I mean, unless the whole the name of the game is revenue, right? And unless you see a tangible difference in revenue, all the other metrics are somewhat pointless unless you see it there. But in your case, um, you've obviously achieved it. And so I'd like to understand in terms of your opens and what were the key metrics that you were tracking uh, related to to your campaigns? Yeah, so we were tracking open rates, click-through rates, reply rates, uh, set rates, and closing rates. And I would say that's that's kind of in ascending order what we were looking at. So obviously, like you said, revenue is the key, closing rates are the key. Um, for us, set rates uh, was a particular pinch point and then reply rates um, as sort of the next most important things. Um, for us, I think we, again, we, we have this proven product, right? We have something that we're looking to scale further using this tool. So it's not that mm. we're just starting out and we, we're doing essentially like market research. We, we know this works. So the key thing I think for us has been focusing on the set mm. rate, uh, which mm. has been, you know, maybe like 1% set rate. And that's something that we really have been working to improve uh, because I think the, the key has been mm. with some of these leads, uh, high velocity, high speed to lead. And so for us, it's like, how can we respond as quickly as possible to this lead? How quickly can we get them to book a call? Because that's really been the key, I think, for us in terms of closing these folks. Got it. Um, and if you could give us like a rough idea for the KPIs you mentioned, let's say a couple of months into the campaign, once you hit a couple of closes, what were your percentages like? I'm sure it's hard to be exact, but a rough ballpark figure would work. Yeah, this is something that I've been uh, trying to track and it's it's not an exact science, but I think for us, you know, kind of the benchmarks that we were looking for and that it, we're still looking for, we're still scaling this, we're still building this. We're only, you know, four months, five months full time in and a lot of these KPIs uh, have taken others six to 12 months to get. But I think close rate would be a big one. So closes over total sets is how I calculate that. So right now we're at about uh, 5%. Uh, we'd love to see something closer to 2030. Um, set rate. Uh, so right now, again, uh, about 1%. We'd like to see something closer to 2 or 3%. Uh, reply rate. Uh, so replies over unique opens. And that is about... Eight or nine percent for us would love to be closer to like twenty, um, and then click through rate, which has been something that we've experimented with different things: sending people links within an email, not sending people links within the email. If you don't send the links, then that boosts your reply rate. So it's a balance for sure. But I would say you know those things roughly in order are the things that we've been looking at: close, set, reply, click through. Got it. Thank you for being so transparent with your numbers. Um, it's it's definitely valuable for others as well because a lot of people have this impression especially the ones who are new to the game that with outbound unless you see like a 50 or 60 percent uh, opens and clicks they have all these numbers in their head but ultimately these are just guidelines and it completely depends on the nature of your industry the nature of your product and um, these should just be to help you and these are not hard and fast rules and i think this is a good example of that um uh, you've managed to find great success with this. Um, and, and you said that one of the big challenges or something that you're working on presently is kind of scaling this whole thing, right? So I wanted to ask you, what does that process look like and how do you manage to keep things personalized while continuing to scale? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, I think it's one of those things where there's a balance between what is our brand? How do we protect our brand? And how do we scale? How do we grow at a sustainable rate, right? 
So I think it's a I think it's a mix of things, right? I think it's both. I think on the one hand, for people who are speakers who we know are speakers, we we kind of know the pitch, and that's something that we can scale fairly quickly. One thing that I've been experimenting with is for people who reply, like if we're sending out to you know two thousand people or five thousand or ten thousand people, for people who mm. reply, and there's going to be you know a decent number that do. Mm. How do we personalize our responses to that person? Even if it's just something like a PS, right? Like PS, mm. saw what you're doing on LinkedIn with speaking in X industry. You know, really mm. impressed. Mm. You know, we'd love to chat, et cetera. So that's that's sort of one angle that we can mm. sort of do pretty easily on the on the inbound side. Another angle that I've been thinking about more is, you know, how do we get as mm. hyper personalized as possible to that ICP, right? So for instance, if our ICP, which for us is like people who are already doing coaching consulting and want to scale speaking. It's like, okay, you know, how can I find the people who are going to be most likely to want our product and then tailor that initial first sign of the email mm. as closely as possible based on what they're doing, right? Another angle that I've looked at has been, you know, how can we do that based on schools that people go mm. to? So for instance, I, I went, I did undergrad at Princeton. Uh, we have another person on the team as a Princeton alum. I tested a, a campaign sequence where it's reaching out to people who are Princeton alumni who are speakers and saying, hey, so what you're doing is speaking. Mm. Hey, you know, my company, which also has these Princeton alums, you know, helps out people mm. who are speakers and really, you know, focusing on that side mm. of it, which makes it look like a lot more like, mm. you know, a friend sent this to you than a company sent this to you. And that's an idea that I didn't come up with. Somebody mm. else sent that to me about, you know, mentioning Princeton. And it wasn't a super impressive email. Otherwise, it wasn't a product that I needed. But I was like, this, you know, this made me open it. And that's that's the key, right? So that's those are things that I've been thinking about in terms of personalization. That's really cool. Uh, that's I mean, I guess you have to experiment with different things and see what works best with your audience. So, James, one final one for you. Um, you've tried got great success with inbound as well as outbound. And, and you mentioned that one of the things that has helped you be successful is having an offer that you know which works, having a clearly defined ICP. Nevertheless, I'm sure you would have faced some challenges while trying to get your outbound engine started. What were the biggest challenges you faced and what is your advice to other businesses trying to do the same? Yeah, so... One of the challenges that we've faced more with cold outbound is from a technical perspective. Um, so for instance, we started out using Zoho Mail, which recently basically axed cold outbound. So we had to transfer. Um, it looks like from what I'm seeing with other people who I follow that Google is wanting to do the same thing. So if you're using Gmail inboxes for cold outbound, Google wants to crack down on that in the same way that Zoho did. So finding an email provider um, that makes sense has been the key, and it's a little bit of whack-a-mole, uh, but I've heard people using good success or finding good success with Outlook, with GoDaddy domains. Uh, we've been using a tool called InfraMail, which has had pretty good deliverability lately. So those are some those are some things that we just had to learn the hard way. Uh, but there's a lot in terms of the copy and other things like that, the offer itself, that I feel like are, are just as, if not more so, important. Well said, James. I guess it's all about yeah, experimenting with everything right from the software, right to your technical setup, right to your value prop, the copy, everything. It's a, there's there's a lot of great information out there. There's a lot of great tools out there. It's all about finding, <clears throat> excuse me, finding that balance to get it to best work for you and your business. James, it's been an absolutely fantastic conversation. I've really enjoyed your insights and how transparent you've been with your data, with your processes and what's worked well. Um, we, we'd like to close this with a fun little segment where I hit you with a bunch of rapid fire questions and you answer with the first thing that pops into your head. You ready, James? Great. This is Hey Name Quick Question. James, emojis in emails, yay or nay? I would say no, but I haven't tested this seriously. So I would take that with a grain of salt. Got it. Best performing subject line for you. We found a lot of success with quick question, but some of the other things I think that people will find helpful are things that are tailored to their offer. So another one for us might be something like new opportunity to make X amount as a paid speaker, for instance. 
great uh one cold outbound technique that you think is severely underrated yeah i think rapid response is probably the biggest thing uh as well as helping people set personalized calls there have been times when people will say stuff like i can't find a time or something like that and i'll say something like hey i found this time that works that's you know in your calendar i went ahead and booked it let me know if you have any issues just really trying to be as personalized and and helpful as possible when people want to book a call great three of your favorite resources to learn about outbound emails I recommend in terms of resources learning would be cole gordon school um so if you go school.com s k o o l.com Cole Gordon has a really good cold outbound course where he basically walks through his whole process instantly. Also has some really good resources. And then there's a traffic and conversion summit uh, that has recordings. Somebody who I found to be really helpful has been Perry Belcher. He does uh, more inbound email, but a lot of the things that he talks about apply to cold outbound as well. So those would be three that I recommend. There's there's some great shouts in there. Two people on LinkedIn to follow for the best sales insights. Yeah, I would say somebody who I've really been enjoying following has been Scott Martinis. Uh he does a lot on cold outbound and sales that I found to be really helpful. And then another person who I'm broadening out a little bit more to social media but Alex Bourbon. Um he does a lot on YouTube. I think a little bit on LinkedIn as well, but hmm. he's somebody who has been doing cold outbound for a long time and when it comes to trends things like who's uh who's on top of cold outbound that sort of thing he's been somebody who's been really helpful to follow absolutely alex uh is a master of uh, cold email and produces great content as well so that's a great shout last one for you james one cold email hot take that you hold that most people would probably disagree with yeah so this is something that i would say for email in general um has been something that we found that has worked that not everybody would recommend but using the RE and FW like forward sort of subject lines has been something that I think used sparingly used in a way that's hmm. not overloading people does work uh people do open stuff that has those stuff in there and sometimes hmm. you have to hmm. find ways like in HubSpot that you can't do it directly you have to find ways around it but that's been something that has worked for us when used sparingly to increase those mm. up and open rates that is quite the hot take and that's an interesting answer james and we are done with the segment and thank you so much for all your insights what a wonderful chat and again thank you for being so transparent with all all your learnings uh, before i let you go james for those who want to follow more of, more of your work and what you're doing where can they find you Yeah, I would uh say LinkedIn is probably my primary. I'm I'm not as active on Twitter. I have a Twitter, uh but uh yeah, James Haines uh on LinkedIn would probably be the best way to reach me. Awesome. Uh you heard it here folks, James Haines on LinkedIn. Give the man a follow. Uh you you've heard what he has to say and I'm sure he has plenty of more nuggets as he keeps trying to scale this and gets new learnings. Um uh, James, once again, Thank you so much uh, for joining us on the Sales Spotlight podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um have a great rest of the day. Thank you Jay. Really appreciate it. Thank you again for your time. Uh ladies and gentlemen, you heard that's James Haines for you and that's another episode of the Sales Spotlight podcast in the books. I'll catch you all at the next one. I'm Jay. Peace.